It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the Omics Group for inviting me to speak, to present today, and to also act as co-chair with um, Olena. I enjoyed working with some of you this morning in the workshop, and I think that was very valuable to get to know what everyone is doing and what your thoughts are on climate change with respect to not just curriculum development, but your overall goals and solutions. And so today, I'm going to present some research that I've been working on for a while uh, relating to sea level rise in a very vulnerable area in the United States, Florida Bay, which includes Monroe County, Dade County, Miami, and the Florida Keys. A very populous area and a very environmentally sensitive area as well. Um, my background, I'm a civil engineer, environmental engineer, and also a geologist. I teach at Framingham State University in Massachusetts, which is just near Boston. The reason I'm presenting about Florida is that as an undergraduate student, I attended and graduated from the University of Miami, where I had the great fortune to study with Dr. Cesare Emiliani, who's the, considered to be the father of paleoceanography and paleoclimatology. And he worked on some groundbreaking research starting back in the 1950s uh, through the 80s. And I think most famously, Emiliani is known for proving that there were seven ice ages rather than the previously accepted four of the continental ice age theory. And this work was uh, done by examination of oxygen isotope ratios in uh, foraminifera. And so I also did some research for Emiliani in that area too as uh, helping out one of his graduate students. So this led me to become interested in the South Florida area, and uh, I've highlighted Florida Bay, which is my area of study. In particular, I've taken a look at some data from a gauging station, a uh, NOAA gauging station in Vaca Key, V-A-C-A, -A, which is in the middle keys at latitude and longitude shown on this particular map. I made several trips to the area as an undergraduate, and then most recently, two years ago, and one of my trips in the area, my first exposure to this area, was actually led by Emiliani, who introduced us to the carbonate, uh, shallow carbonate platform geology of the area and the uh, dominant coral reef uh, geomorphology. So I'm going to take a closer look at um, the southern part of Florida and the bay itself, in particular, some observations that uh, I noted when I was there in 2012 from Flamingo, which is at very near the, the uh, bottom of the Florida Peninsula itself. Uh, that's a, a commercial fishing and recreational fishing area. It's also a tourist area. It flanks the Everglades National Park. So to get to Flamingo, you must drive through the Everglades or you go by boat. And um, you can see Florida Bay has very shallow water depth. So everything in light blue is less than three feet of water depth. So that's about 40% of Florida Bay is quite shallow. Off to the right, you see the Florida Keys archipelago um, and John Pennecamp, Pennecamp Coral Reef State Park, which is about 100 square miles of uh, state park preserved area for diving and snorkeling. And then um, also of interest is the core, Bob Allen core, which was um, installed in the middle of the bay, which provides us with sedimentary data to correlate salinity levels going back to uh, about the year 1800. So certainly post um, uh, pre-industrialization industrialization of the area up through present. So we see that there's been a great impact between outflow from the Everglades into the bay uh, and with changing salinity levels over time. The, the Florida Keys and the bay, as I mentioned, is a shallow water, very sensitive environment with a diversity of species of fish and uh, invertebrates and other marine life. So I had the good fortune to fish in the bay in 2012. You probably can tell that I like recreational fishing. I enjoy that, catch and release, sustainable policies as well. And there are abundant species of fish. Um, on the left is a redfish, and on the right is uh, what's known as a triple tail. Excellent sport fish. And my guide in the middle, Eric, uh, related some very interesting news to me. He told me that he's been fishing in the area for 30 years and that certain docks, not these ones in particular, but similar docks that were submerged 
during the fall flood high water level back in the 1980s for two weeks are now today submerged during the fall for two months. So this was very alarming to me. I, I thought, you know, I was there in the 1980s as a student and I vaguely remember this, that it was just an annual fall flood cycle, but not of any great impact for two weeks to uh, submerge a number of docks. And this has uh, some impact economically because these are docks with, uh, from which fishing vessels need to depart and, and um, there's some commercial implications. But today, these same docks were noted by my guide to be submerged for two months. So I took a look at the nearest gauging station data I could find, which, as I mentioned, is in Vaca Key, in the middle Florida Keys. And this is the station here. It's been operating since December of 1970, collecting tide and water level data and meteorological data since 1970. So we have about a 45-year record of data, which I think is pretty substantial to do an analysis and take a look at trends. And the some information about the station, the maximum water level recorded uh, since it began taking measurements in 1970 was 5.8 feet uh, above mean high high water, higher high water. And that was during Hurricane Wilma in 2005, which was a Category 3 storm. You may remember Hurricane Wilma affected Florida. There were 62 deaths and that was um, the fifth most costly storm economically in U.S. history. So we, we think about hurricanes Katrina and Rita, Hugo and others. Wilma was actually number five on the list. And uh, it caused intense flooding in Florida, in South Florida. So remember Hurricane Wilma as I'll come back to that. So here is the record of data which I downloaded with a normalized change in feet varying from 1970 through the present with some extremes that um, vary as much as about two feet. So what I think is really interesting and concerning and quite um, correlating to what my fishing guide had told me was that the annual fall flood heights in October and, and in the fall in the 1980s are now today the average heights. So you can see on the left in around 1985 the fall flood heights, the extremes, are today the averages. So this is substantial change in a very short time frame. Uh, in, inside the uh, economic career, essentially, of a, of a fishing guide who works these waters on a daily basis. So this is a trend that um, I've taken a little bit further look at. If we look at it on a monthly basis, this is the annual, the average water height variation monthly, month to month, for this gauging station in Vaca Key. And we indeed see that the peak is in the 10th month in October. And that is high enough to submerge the docks in the Flamingo area for two months versus the two weeks observed back in the 1980s. So what are we seeing today? I'm trying to, co to coordinate some qualitative measurements and observations with quantitative. So I'm talking right now about the qualitative. We see that the docks in Flamingo at the, at the tip of Florida are submerged for two months a year in the fall compared to two, two to three weeks in the 1980s. We also see other um, disturbing trends that after strong storms, particularly in the Miami and Miami Beach area, there is prolonged flooding. There's simply a insufficient capacity of drainage to channel the floodwaters back to the bay. And so the flooding exists for days after a strong storm. We also see something very interesting that non-storm event seawater flooding occurs during certain lunar high tides. So this is happening several times a year during dry conditions. And so the tides are just strong enough now to back up water levels through the storm drainage system in Miami Beach in particular and cause flooding. In fact, the, just the tidal event flooding is becoming more common and it caused the National Weather Service to issue a coastal flood warning from a, 19, from a 2013 tidal event for Miami-Dade County. So that had nothing to do with the storm. 
We also find significant beach erosion from central Florida southward down to Miami-Dade County. Uh, just Miami-Dade County alone has budgeted $32 million for beach erosion control and renourishment between 2013 and 2017. And we also have observed saltwater intrusion into the Biscayne Aquifer, a substantial aquifer of groundwater that supplies metropolitan Miami and, and Miami-Dade County. And this is not a new phenomenon since the area has become quite developed starting back in the 1950s uh, through the 60s and 70s in particular. There was increased pumping of groundwater, diversion of water from the Everglades through can man-made canal systems to provide water for agricultural irrigation and consumption to Miami. And so um, that had those activities have lowered the water table and salt water has intruded. So water, water has been tasting saltier since about the 1950s, uh, first notice. So these are all the qualitative observations. What are people seeing? What are their records and observations of impacts of climate change without taking measurements, just noticing? So my intent is to coordinate that with some more quantitative measurements. I've been talking a little bit about Miami-Dade County. Here is a map of the county. Uh, Miami-Dade is a population of 2.5 million in the county. Metro Miami itself, which is in this area, has about 500,000 population, making this the largest populated county in Florida and actually the seventh most populated county in the United States. You can see at the bottom here are the Florida Keys, the beginning of the Florida Keys, the Upper Keys, and Florida Bay, my area of study. Flamingo is down here with the docks that were observed. And all of this is the Everglades in this area. So all these observations uh, qualitatively have made the news, unsurprisingly. And in fact, some of the top stories of the Miami Herald have been about sea level rise and its impact upon South Florida. It's even become a security issue. Homeland Security Newswire has deemed Miami as ground zero for risks associated with sea level rise. Why is that? Population, real estate value, commercial industry, vulnerability, and um, tourism. So it has become not just an environmental issue, but potentially even a security issue as well, too. Even the venerable Rolling Stone magazine has weighed in on this. If you're not familiar with Rolling Stone, it's a music trades magazine, mostly of rock and roll and other uh, trends in music. And their headline is, Goodbye Miami. Uh, be, by the end of the, century, end of the century, Miami will be completely underwater. And there's even a quote. They went and got a quote from Dr. Cesare Emiliani's successor, Dr. Hal Wanless at University of Miami. He says, Miami as we know it today is doomed. So it's a very grim assessment by the professor and chair of the geological department at the University of Miami. So this photo actually shows the streets of Miami, downtown Miami, right after Hurricane Wilma that I had mentioned previously. And flooding persisted for days after the hurricane had cleared and, and passed. Let's look at some numbers some uh, more quantitative analysis. This is from NOAA, and they have taken a look at water levels at Vaca Key and the Middle Keys since 1970 through present, and they've removed the average seasonal cycle here to come up with a linear trend of just under three millimeters a year of sea level rise. What does that mean? That's equivalent to about 0.9 feet in 100 years, so about 11 inches, uh, with statistical projections shown. That's quite a bit. So I've been interested in the extremes. I mentioned the fall extremes that flooded certain docks that were noted to uh, be underwater for several months. So I took a look at the fall, the October fall mean water levels annually since 1970, and I made my own projection here, too, uh, using MATLAB in this program that shows some interesting trends. So it shows currently we're at about 3.7 feet mean sea level in the fall. 
with a projection to go by 2050 to 4.1 and at a high confidence level of 95 on the high end about 4.5 feet. What I noticed with the fall flood levels is an interesting trend is that we get a dampening amplitude of the annual fall flood oscillations. So that leads me to conclude that perhaps the 4.1 figure is probably more accurate uh, rather than the extreme. That may be good news uh, depending upon exposure and, and vulnerability of certain structures. Other projections, Climate Central, have come up with more uh, radical and higher uh, extreme flooding scenarios. They looked at eight water level stations around coastal Florida. Variations were slight. Their analysis projected a range of sea level rise from 0.6 to about one and a third feet by 2050 and 1.7, and this is very concerning, to almost five feet by 2100 at Key West. Why Key West? Key West is essentially a proxy for southeast Florida based on its vulnerability and its location. And so um, Vacaquee, where I studied, was about two inches higher than that. So this is an extreme pro projection. Here are some graphs that show the, the monitoring station. Here is Key West. The blue square is Vacaquee, my area of study. And Apalachicola is here. And Miami is in this area. There's no gauging station. So what are their forecasts? By 2050, about a one-foot sea level rise at Vacaquee in blue. And by 2100, four feet. So that's an extreme projection. I, argue that you know, based on some dampening oscillations that I've noticed that it's not going to be that high. What are the existing risks based on this today and what will they be tomorrow? Well today every coastal flood is wider, deeper, more damaging due to the approximately eight inches of uh, global warming driven sea level rise since 1900 and this is quoted from IPCC which has been well cited during this conference. Okay, this rise has already increased annual flood risks threefold for Key West, which I said is a proxy for Southeast Florida. In fact, the 100 year flood at Key West is only 2.2 feet above current mean high water. So, if we in fact do see the four feet of forecast from Climate Central, then the 100 year flood will certainly, over the next few decades, be a frequent occurrence. So, who's at risk? Miami-Dade has more people living less than four feet above sea level than any state in the nation except Louisiana. More than 10% of the land in the county is less than a foot, 20% less than two feet, and 25% less than three feet. Homes, businesses, schools, hospitals, infrastructures, wastewater facilities, hazardous waste treatment sites are all at risk, and there are many within the three feet elevation mark. This graph shows the receptors on land less than three feet of elevation. These are percent figures. You'll see right away that this solid blue, dark blue band is from Monroe County, which is where the Florida Keys are located. And we see nearly 75% of land in Monroe County is less than three feet. Homes, property value, nearly 50%. Uh, population vulnerability, we get into some sociological aspects. Um, population of color and vulnerable economically as well as wastewater treatment sites and EPA listed hazardous waste sites. Miami-Dade County is also at risk, not quite as much, with only 25 percent of land less than three feet, but still substantially at risk. So um, I'll conclude with a few more slides about what can we do? What are these populations at risk doing? Well, in my view, as, a, as an engineer, they can only adapt and mitigate, or mitigate and adapt. And one of the patterns we're seeing is housing density development has um, reflected an attempt to steer clear of the flood risk. There are fewer developments now within the one foot elevation, uh, even fewer than in the past in terms of population density. And this becomes, I think, a good practice. Beach renourishment, 23 million cubic yards of beach renourishment is going to be needed in 50, over the next 50 years to, to sustain the viability of South Florida's beaches, uh, the tourism and the aesthetic viability. Pumping stations, 
we're going to need more pumping stations to augment the existing flood and salinity control structures. They may cost up to $70 million each, plus the land acquisitions. This could be hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, but it's necessary. And of course, stormwater management, recapture, and storage. Underground storage is now proposed uh, and with slow return back to the bay. In fact, the city of Miami Beach is considering spending $200 million on a stormwater management program which would recapture, store, and return stormwater retention and then um, increase the height of seawalls. So what are the conclusions? It's a well-proven fact that global warming has led to sea level rise since 1870. That's been eight inches globally in southeast Florida. It's 50 percent higher on a local level. We've seen qualitative observations, which I mentioned, docks submerged, saltwater intrusion, flooding during lunar high tides that are non-storm event related, and prolonged flooding after storms. This all demonstrates that sea level rise is occurring in real time. It's happening right now. People can observe it in the course of their career, their life, today in the news. By 2060, by mid-century, sea levels along Florida's coast could rise another nine inches to two feet. I've talked about some of the vulnerability of that. In particular, the Hurricane Wilma was a 75-year storm with its seven-foot storm surge. Well, with one foot of sea level rise, that will decrease in frequency to a 21-year event. With another foot above that of sea level rise, it'll be a five-year event. So there certainly needs to be response to this. This is of major impact to Miami's population, property, infrastructure, and people. Uh, the good news is that mitigative measures are already underway and adaptation is in progress. This is a very sensitive area. Uh, it's loved by many people, fishing, tourism, recreation, but it is certainly an environment at risk. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank you very much. Yes, do you need a microphone? No. I don't, I'm pretty loud. I don't think okay. I okay. Love to see you. Thank you. I'll tell, I'll tell my wife that she'll be so proud of me for dressing nicely. Uh, question and comment. Questions really quick. Uh, did you deal with or incorporate geostatic, uh, uh, geostatic rebound? Uh, in this, is there any going on there? What's the impact? That sort of thing. In the second, mm -hmm. the comment, is I've heard that Miami's substrate is quite porous. And so there is, from a adaptation standpoint, there's no practical way to, to create seawalls and pump out. What is that true? What's, how does that impact their ability to adapt? Okay, so the first, I did not uh, include a geostatic rebound. Uh, it's less of an impact in uh, the tropical uh, regions. So, uh, no, I just based my observations on records and projections and some trends that I saw as well as qualitative analyses. The <clears throat> second question is, yes, Miami is underlain by limestone, oolitic limestone. It's a shallow carbonate geological uh, reef environment platform. It is quite porous, uh, which makes it a great aquifer for uh, groundwater and the Biscayne Aquifer. Uh, what's being proposed for stormwater storage yeah, for one of the examples that I gave in mitigation and adaptation is to basically build underground storage uh, reservoirs, concrete vaults essentially, to pump excess seawater into them for retention and then pump back out into the bay uh, following storm events. So this is one of the plans that's been proposed for Miami Beach. Uh, construction of higher seawalls, it would have to be contiguous, there couldn't be any gaps in the walls, so that's more problematic because um, I think that that's virtually an impossibility to do that. But there has been proposal to construct seawalls to a height of six feet, which I think will be rather unsightly but might be necessary. The question is uh, making them contiguous so there are no holes or gaps for floodwaters to enter is going to be problematic. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, uh, thanks for the, your presentation, very interesting one. Are you aware of any study like um, that explain why Florida would have a higher sea level rise than the global average? And also, like, are you aware, because like your prediction use kind of, I think some regression study or some prediction based on a uh, past trend, are you aware of any like physical model that take into account of local topography? 
into like what, uh, what will be the sea, sea level rise in the future? That's a good question. I didn't take it quite that, that deep. I can comment only that uh, because of the warming, uh, the warmer seawater, that there's certainly more expansion of seawater in that area and, and may have more of a localized effect. And also, um, what I'd like to look at is the interaction between the Everglades and outflow into the bay that may be causing you know, an increased um, elevation of water level too. So that's a more complex issue to look at that. But um, apart from doing the regression analysis and looking at extremes and data observation, uh, I'm not aware of a model that, that answers the question why it's 50% higher in, in the Florida area. Great. We look forward to that. Very good. Just a quick comment. Um, I think we are facing a paradox in this region because on one hand, you know, we have clear data showing that uh, all the risks for the region. On the other hand, it's a very prestigious place to live and uh, the prices are going up. The real estate is extremely active. The new condos are being built and so it's, it's the most popular destination to retire. So to what extent the general public is really aware of those risks and uh, how seriously they're taken. And I'm wondering, you know, how the future urban planning of Greater Miami mm -hmm. and you know, the entire Southern F Florida would s face the coincidence of, you know, these two almost non-compatible trends. So that's a very good comment, Elena. It, it, Miami is a popular destination because of its uh, retirement area. Uh, it's a, a wonderful climate, and um, it's attractive and has a lot of tourists and aesthetic appeal. So there have been some restrictions on uh, development within one, two feet elevation, and the population density is now uh, reflecting that. It's lower. There have been increased insurance premiums to essentially um, not prevent but discourage development in certain areas because it would be simply uh, too expensive. But it's a wealthy area, um, some parts of it are, and um, for those that uh, can spend the money they may not care about that. But the general population, there are many people at risk, there are many people of color at risk, uh, particularly in the Florida Keys that earn their living from fishing and other activities and tourism. And I think there's going to be a, a mass migration from that area in the future. They will simply have to leave and go to higher ground because it'll be too costly for not just towns and municipalities to install mitigative and adaptative uh, measures, but um, population won't be able to afford that and they'll have to relocate. So we're going to see a mass, I think, um, movement of people in the future that are essentially um, fleeing climate change and sea level rise because they'll have to, they'll have no other choice. Okay.